Hello, and welcome to episode 62 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. We're here today with Mo Vela, CEO of the Vela Group, attorney, entrepreneur, author, former director of management and senior advisor to Vice President Joe Biden, and former CFO and senior advisor to Vice President Al Gore. It's quite a laundry list there, Mo. <laughs> Welcome to, to the show. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Great. So the first the question I'd like to ask you is, what are you currently doing or what have you ever done to advance the public interest and why? Well, well, well let's go back a little bit first. Okay. Um, I would like to think that now, I have to be honest with you, of all the interviews I've ever done and speeches I've ever given, I don't think I've ever been asked this question. It's really interesting. Okay, I would like to think the first thing I ever did was at the age of five, four or five, I sang a campaign commercial huh. for the re-election of Lyndon Baines Johnson. Oh my God. I was, a te- I was from Texas, in the southern, southern tip of Texas. Uh-huh. My mother played the piano and I sang, uh, let's all go vote for LBJ and put him in again. So I'd like <laughs> to think that was my first contribution to the public interest. How's How did that? they identify you? How does like a four or five year old get in front of the president? You know, I think mom just, my mom was such a talented uh, new musician and, uh-huh. and I, I have no idea to be honest with you how <laughs> they picked the Vela family but somehow I got to be this little kid who s- literally sat on the crook of a grand piano uh-huh. and it aired in a commercial all over the state of Texas for uh, the President Johnson's wow. campaign. Yeah, Apparently so, it was pretty effective. You know, well, he did carry that <laughs> state in that campaign. <laughs> it was his home state. So well, I, I can't take too much credit. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I, I, all joking aside, I, I honestly, I think that's where my kind of contributions to uh, the public interest and began in that political way, but mm-hmm. campaigns are a contribution to the public interest. I believe that with every ounce of my being. And mm-hmm. so I would say that was my first one. And then it hasn't stopped since, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I, I guess the highlight of my contributions, if, if we were to call them that, I hope they were contributions. Right. Um, were being the first openly gay American to serve twice in a senior role in the White House and huh. the first Hispanic American to serve twice in a senior role in the White House. And so I hope that that has not only contributed to the public interest and advancement of the LGBT and Latino communities, but of all Americans. And in, in you know, my effort to break a couple of ceilings, glass mm-hmm. ceilings, and mm-hmm. a couple of, knock down a couple of doors, right? Yeah. So, um, all right. So, well, on the topic of diversity, that's actually a topic that's been in the news quite a lot. Yeah. And we think about, I actually read some article about an, a journalist who spent some time in Europe, and he said Americans often are very interested in the first of a certain kind mm-hmm. to, to do a certain activity. Why do you think that's important? Why does it matter that you were the first LGBT uh, individual to serve in two White Houses and the first Latino to serve in two White Houses? You know, I, I I don't I don't have enough of an ego to think it's like overwhelmingly important, right? Mm-hmm. What I do believe, what I do hope, mm-hmm. is that it demonstrated to younger uh, Latinos and LGBT Americans mm-hmm. that that there was nowhere they there was nowhere they couldn't reach, right? And that hopefully, um, if there was any importance to it, Jordan, mm-hmm. frankly, mm-hmm. it was that that that. It's it's a message it's, it's, so, to know, anybody who's ever felt different, marginalized, disenfranchised, or maybe the underdog, if you will. Yeah, that there isn't anything you can't accomplish, right? So, so it's, it's not about me; it's, it's about all of you. It's like an inspirational story. I hope so. Okay, I sure hope <laughs> so. Uh, those those long fifteen hour days. Yeah, um, you know, I took a seventy two percent cut in pay to come back and serve the second time. Wow. So it's, why did you do it? Because I believe in this country with every fiber of my being and I, I I'll be I'll tell you the story very quickly it's in my book and mm-hmm. hopefully we're going to talk about my book a little bit in a I'd minute love to. right I hope so <laughs> um but uh if we don't that's okay too but it is in my book and that the story is that I had was very happily living a life as a successful businessman and entrepreneur in Denver Colorado huh had gotten out of politics Mm -hmm. and had actually been making the joke for several years that I had been quote unquote cured of the political bug. Uh And so, um, 
I all I could do for the first time was max out my contribution to the Obama Biden ticket. Yeah. That was my extent of my involvement in politics that election in 2008. And uh, so the day after the election, the phone rang, and it was the man that I call my Jewish angel, Ron Klain, uh-huh. uh, who I speak tr- a lot about in the book. Uh, and it was Ron, and he said, I'm going to be in Denver tomorrow. Huh. Are you available to have a drink? Huh. Well, and I didn't think anything of the timing, mind right. you. Yeah. I was so enthralled with my multifamily real estate business. We had just raised multiple millions of dollars on Wall Street. Yeah. We were doing extremely well. I had come up with a whole new way to service Latinos in the multifamily real estate industry. Huh. It was taking off. I was making more money than I ever thought I'd ever make in my life. Yeah. And I said, oh, my God, Ron, I'd love to see you. I'll be there tomorrow at four. I need him for a drink. And yeah. I'm just as dumb as dirt going down there as naive as can be, <laughs> not realizing, well, wait, what is Ron doing here the day after the election? Why is he wanting to have a drink with me in Denver? Uh-huh. Uh, although he was a dear friend. He's always been like a brother to me and one of my mentors and role models. And even though we're a month apart in age, yeah. I might add. <laughs> <laughs> but he's one of the most brilliant, incredible human beings I've ever met on my journey. And he so was I, involved with the administration. Well, he was the chief, my chief of staff under Al Gore. Oh. So this is a, like a blast from the past at this point, right? Okay. So eight years later, right. he's like, hey, it's me. Are you in town? Mm-hmm. And I go meet him for a drink. Mm-hmm. And I'm just sitting there going, how's your wife, Monica? How are the kids? Yeah. You know, and we're just talking about personal stuff. And yeah. at which time he just segues into, I, um, I, I have told Vice President Biden I will take be his chief of staff, but one of the most important parts of me going to do that is if you would come back and be the director of management and administration. Huh. And so that's how that happened. And I said no. I cried a little bit because I'm an emotional, passionate kind of Latino <laughs> <laughs> and gay. So, you know, maybe that was the reason I got, I don't know. But I did shed a few tears yeah. and I was very humbled and touched by Ron's generosity. Um, and I said, no. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, I have to fly back home. Why don't you sleep on it? And I don't remember who it was on that Friday, three, two days later, but either he or the vice president elect said, uh, your country needs you. And I said, when do I start? (laughs) That's how that happened. And I came back and yeah, you take a 72% cut in pay because I, I, I believe, Mm -hmm. I believe in my nation. I believed in in the President Obama and Vice President Biden, I believed in their vision for our country. Mm-hmm. And here we sit eight years later, uh, watching the progress we have made and all the accomplishments they achieved. And and their vision was a beautiful vision for our country. So, gosh, so you said no because I guess life would become more difficult by saying yes. Yes. I, you know, look, life would be more difficult. Yeah, I was how many thousands, of mi- a couple thousand miles away. I knew I had to... Lift, you know, completely uplift. Uh, what am I trying to say here? I'm completely to tear apart my life as I knew it. What'd you do with your company? Can you believe it? I had to divest and I lost all of my interest in that company. Really? Yes. Do you think Donald Trump will have to do that with his company? Well, should he? Should he put his stuff in blind trust? Absolutely. Uh huh. Do will he have to divest? I don't know. Uh, you know, I know I I had to. Um, and I don't regret it, Jordan. I don't regret it for one minute. But do I think that Mr. Trump should at least put his uh, assets in blind trust? I absolutely do. So why is it that you feel so strongly to answer the call to serve your country? Why is it that when they said your country needs you and the vice president called, you're like, yeah, but, you know, like my family needs me. The Latinos need some financing to afford their homes in Denver. Yeah. That was you know, helping people. Yeah. Why is it when he says, hello, Mo, Yeah. we need you. Yeah. Why is it that you then felt compelled to say yes? Why is it you feel so strongly about serving America? First and foremost, I think that I was raised with uh, the ideals of public service. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was raised in an environment and in a home and in a family, a pioneer Texas family who has been in public service for decades Mm -hmm. in South Texas. Mm -hmm. So for us, it was a way of life. My uncle was one of the first United States federal district judges that was Hispanic in the history of the United States. In fact, the federal courthouse in Brownsville, Texas is co-named after him. Now, he's not the only one in your family with a public building named after him. No, my father, they both, he and my uncle and my father both have 
middle schools named after them in my home area. Right. And um, so that gives you a great example of this ideal, this the value that we were taught to place in public service and not just public service, community service and giving back in, in doing our little itty bitty minuscule part mm-hmm. to try to make our country the best it could be. And so when someone says your country needs you, you know, if you frankly, uh, not to sound in any way cheesy, this is something from as soulfully as I can say it. Mm-hmm. But when someone says your country needs you and you stop and you think, I never served my country in uniform, the least I can do is take a 72% cut in pay and go do my part to make sure the vice president's office was set up correctly. There were so few of us, less than a handful, frankly, that had ever managed the vice president's office before. So you ask, you know, you feel so strongly when someone says to you, your country needs you. Do you feel like there's a single soul in this country who is not needed by this country? And if you don't feel that way, if you feel like every soul is needed in this country and our country needs each and every one of our listeners and each and every one of everyone that our listeners know, then what is it? Do we not? How do we sound the clarion call and let everyone know? That our country needs them and that they matter and they're important to their community and to our community, which is one and the same, depending on how you define communities, and and that everyone is needed to answer the call of public service. Yeah. Is everyone called to to publicly serve? Let's let's define public service before I answer that question, right? Because there's one thing to say that... uh, Public service is the type that I might have been blessed to engage in twice, right? In my two tenures in the White House. That is obviously the most visible way to publicly serve. But I believe public service is not just when you go work for our government or your local government or your state government, right? Public service to me, Mm -hmm. and there will be many who might be listening and go, he doesn't know the proper definition. Well, I throw out the proper definition because sometimes we have to define things in our own work. What's the Movella definition? The Movella definition of public service is that, yes, every single person in this country can serve our country. And it doesn't have to be in office. It doesn't have to be as an elected official. It doesn't have to be in a government position. It can be by by actually going to volunteer to 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 help on the local level, uh, maybe to volunteer at your local school district, mm-hmm. right? Or to volunteer at trash pickup day at a public park. Mm-hmm. Or it could be through volu- any other volunteer, uh, voluntary participation on things that make our community safer, better, more beautiful, Right. And more conducive to a healthy and productive lifestyle for all of us. And so every person can contribute. So I consider that public service. If you are volunteering at the hospital. Yeah. You're serving our public. Anything you're doing selflessly to make the world a better place. Absolutely. It's public service. And that's my definition. And if somebody wants to write you a letter and criticize me, have at it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so you did... um... Mentioned in the beginning of this interview how important political campaigns are, and as much as public service is anything uh, is very so so many very so many things under the sun, we do have to acknowledge that politics has played a role in your life, and public service may though perhaps not totally encapsulated within the world of politics has definitely been shaped by the world of politics. So, what is it about campaigns um, and about politics? That you said uh, that 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 really is important to the American political process. Oh, I I, I think that campaigns and politics. Uh, let's start with the most recent one and work backwards. This was um, in so many ways unprecedented, um, and in so many ways horrifying. Mm-hmm. I would like to almost pretend this one didn't happen because it was in many ways an anomaly from the political and campaigns that I have been so fortunate to be a part of and seen in my adult lifetime, right? Um uh, and and so I don't want to I don't want to use this current one, this past one as the example because I think so much of it was so such bad examples of of what campaign should be. But, now let me interject for yeah. a moment. In case any of our listeners are more conservative or Republican out there, um, 
do you think that and that they may have felt what do you how do you think do you think they may have felt similarly in 2008 when Barack Obama was elected because that was unprecedented in many ways to how liberals and Democrats uh, feel now in 2016? No, I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. Uh, electing the first African-American president had is, is it's an apples and oranges argument, as we used to say in law school. Right. That, that is a complete different feeling of, oh, wow, that's unprecedented. That's a good unprecedented. Okay. There's a bad unprecedented that occurred in this past election where we are using the P word on CNN as if it is a common thing that we all can talk about publicly, mm -hmm. that we are talking about issues of race and racism and bigotry mm -hmm. and, and sexual assault. Mm -hmm. um, these, these things... This is a bad unprecedented. I I never dreamed we would in my lifetime have a presidential election where we discuss the types of things we discussed in this past election. It is just, it's horrifying. So let's move away from presidential elections and talk mm -hmm. more about elections that you've been involved in. I yeah. mean, obviously you started with the presidential election at the age of four or five, but you know, more generally speaking, yeah. you know, maybe talk about the 92 oh, Bush Gore. We have a bunch uh, to talk about, Jordan. Bush, we have, we have uh, a Clinton. bunch of them to talk about. Yeah. Let's go back to 1984 yeah. and talk about uh, my first, um, actually 1982. Okay. Well, 82 or 84. Yeah. Uh, I'm 55 now. These things all become a blur after <laughs> at 55, they say. But uh, somewhere in the early 80s. It would have been 80 uh, or 82. 84. Uh, was well, it was a state election. election. Oh, state election. So I think it was 82, but okay. I'm not sure. We'll have to go back and look. Anyways. Anyway, early 80s, yeah. right? Um, we had a slate of Democrats running in Texas in my home state. Mm -hmm. I actually left college for a semester mm -hmm. because um, in my book, mm -hmm. Little Secret Big Dreams, right? I described this entire story in my book in vivid detail mm -hmm. because I had... Um, the intersection of finally accepting my little secret of being a gay man mm -hmm. had finally come to heads with my uh, with society, if you will, mm -hmm. and my religious upbringing as a Catholic and my cultural upbringing as a Latino, and so they came to a heads, mm -hmm. and I ha something had to give, so I had to drop out of college for a semester to go kind of regroup and gather my thoughts and in that dropping out that semester yeah i went home and worked on my first set of statewide campaigns so you dropped out of college i and ended up working in the white house twice exactly but i went back to college <laughs> okay. let's make it clear i went back to college the next semester okay. and then went on to law school right so i dropped out of college one semester but the reason why was such an emotional and profoundly sad reason mm -hmm. and yet something so sad became look now 30 years later or so 30 what, the, the reason was that you well, i had to grips with your sexuality right my sexuality and it was like at a point where i literally almost had an emotional breakdown because finally at the age of 20 yeah. right uh 20 almost 21 um i just couldn't take this inner conflict any longer so you had to leave campus just to get away from yes it, i had to leave campus to go home and figure out i gotta decide how to live with myself and to accept me so it wasn't in particular like a particular campaign and the candidate was advancing lgbt issues no because at that point honestly in texas are you kidding yeah <laughs> i don't even know if people knew the four letters <laughs> <laughs> certainly not combined let's put it that you way might know four letters but it wouldn't have been those four <laughs> <laughs> and it wouldn't have been an lgbt in that order by no means but 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 uh no so it wasn't about the campaign as much as uh, 20 years of, uh, you know, struggling in my heart and in my soul and in my mind with this inner conflict, knowing that this is who I was, but having been told for 20 years, you're going to burn in hell. That's immoral. That's not right. You can't be that person. That's so I went home sure. and in going, in, go, in, in going home for that semester, yeah. I get hired to help on all our statewide democratic slate, Mark White, Jim Hightower, Gary Morrow, uh, and, and my beloved political mentor of all my life, Ann Richards, who was running for state treasurer in Texas. She later became the governor. Later became the governor. and Her daughter is in charge of Planned Parenthood. Cecile Richards, who my very dear friend. 
And that going home because of my personal turmoil, yeah. personal turmoil, became, look, 30 years later, I got to make American history. Because of that one incident, I got turned on to campaigns and politics. And that's the impact it had on my life. I never looked back after that. And I've worked on two presidentials and various locals and states. So mm -hmm. politics has almost been a salve for you. When you had an identity crisis and you needed a refuge, mm -hmm. you found that in public service, you were mm -hmm. able to channel your, you channel your energy in yeah. a positive way. Absolutely. I also found people who I knew were going to respect me and honor me and celebrate me and who were going to treat you know, treat me with basic human dignity, right? And in, hmm. in my fellow Democrats. And for the Republicans listening, look, there are, I have many, many very special Republican friends that love, honor, and respect and celebrate me as well. So it's not just Democrats. I'm just sharing that at that moment in right. my life, it was the Democratic Party where I felt a home. And it was, um, you know, those candidates who, uh, you know, Ann Richards went on to mentor me politically for the rest of, until she passed away. Huh. And what, so what did it, uh, so you eventually, you began to get involved in politics in Texas, and I, su I suppose you continued to follow that path with the governor being your treasurer and then governor being your mentor, and that's ultimately what led to you getting involved in the Clinton-Gore campaign in 92? It, it, it did, actually. I went back to uh, law school, and I graduated from law school. Mm -hmm. I went to the University of Texas undergraduate. I okay. bleed orange. Hook 'em horns, uh -huh. and then I went back to go to law school. Actually, there's a little piece in there that most people don't know about me, but it's in my book. Yeah, I went to New York and packed four bags of clothes, and I moved to New York to try to make it on Broadway. Huh. So I finally accepted me yeah. and said, "You is this creative soul." Yeah, and trying to make it on Broadway was my dream. Growing up secretly as a young gay kid in South happened? Texas. Well, I tried to make it on Broadway. Okay. Oh my, we're getting into everything here, right? <laughs> People have to buy my book to hear all of the stories, What's right? What's the name of your book? Little Secret Big Dreams. And is there a website that can be purchased on? www.movela.com M-O-E-V-E-L-A.com or write to Amazon.com just type in Little Secret Big Dreams. And it's a story of your life. It is a story of my life, but Let's let me tell you what happened. How what happened in New York? So I go up there to try to make it on Broadway. Yeah, and I'm actually you're not going to believe who was my my next door neighbor at the 92nd Street Y. This was my first introduction to Judaism, uh -huh. and my first time as a young Hispanic Catholic, uh -huh. where I realized I should have been a Jew all along, <laughs> right? Because I fell in love with the Jewish people, uh -huh. and I fell in love with Judaism because I lived at the 92nd Street Y at the Hebrew Y at 92nd in Lexington. No better place for a gay Texas Catholic <laughs> to be. <laughs> exactly. But my neighbor was Harry Connick Jr. So who do you think went to accompany me at my first Broadway audition? Harry Connick Jr. Now, for our listeners who don't know, who is Harry? Harry Connick, Connick Jr. is a judge on was a judge on American Idol the last several years. He has, I believe, he has, I, I don't know how many Grammys, but he is a, a an award winning, very famous musician uh -huh. um, and actor. He's been in several movies. He's so you met him and you started trying. Harry was my place. companist. He went on to be extremely famous. I went on to do podcasts with Jordan Cooper. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, so it sounds like you <laughs> rubbed shoulders with quite an interesting well, array of characters. You're not going to believe this. So I'm having a smooth little time there at the 92nd Street Y. Yeah. Going to Broadway auditions, trying to get in, get in a show. Mm -hmm. And I become best friends with a guy down the hall who was from Ohio and engaged to a woman back in Ohio. And um, I did not understand yet what it meant to be a gay man and fall in love with another man. And I fell in love with him, but he was straight. And somebody drugged our drinks with ecstasy one night at a party. Huh. And we went, and, and I don't mean to get explicit on a, your podcast, but let's just say we, there was some intimacy involved. Yeah. And it... The next morning, he reacted in a very harsh and shocking manner in the sense that uh, it scared him and it scared me. Yeah. And I literally packed two bags, went to LaGuardia Airport, flew back to Texas and didn't go to New York for 12 years. Oh, my God. My heart was pretty traumatic. Tatters. 
Right. You came with four bags, so... I went back with two. I literally left my entire music collection and all my winter sweaters. You could say (laughs) that you left your baggage in New York. (laughs) (laughs) Well, most people leave their heart in San Francisco. I left my bags in New York, so there. There's your emotional baggage. Yeah, but it was a very... I mean, we're laughing now, but it was a very emotional, very difficult time. So again, every time I've had some adversity in Mm. my personal life, my sexuality... Yeah. It, I go back and it turns into... It, Politics is your home and your breath. Yeah, I went back, went to law school, and then uh, I'm working for a major corporation in Texas. And lo and behold, the lady that works next to me says, my best friend uh, runs the state of Texas for the Clinton-Gore campaign. And that is... I looked at her over a, a beer and said, I want to go to Washington. And she said, well, let me put you in touch with her. And the next thing I know, I am a political appointee, a Schedule C political appointee by President Clinton at the Department of Agriculture. Can you believe it? What did you know about agriculture? Well, I didn't know, Jordan. (laughs) (laughs) But the reason was, FYI, was my distant cousin backslash uncle was chairman Kika de la Garza, the chairman of the House Agriculture Committee at the time. So they thought if we put the cousin in government relations, he might be a little more favorable on our budget and whatever, <laughs> but it kind of backfired because he would he would go, I am not going to give you more money just because Mo Vela's here. Yeah. <laughs> so so the, talking about politics, that was fun. Those were fun days. So when I reflect upon... When we reflect upon your life as you've told it here in the last yeah. 20 minutes, when I ask you about public service, it's so interesting to me that you define – I mean we've already defined public service. But the story is uh, marked and, and the milestones are identified by individuals and relationships. Mm-hmm. It seems that you have served your country through and while creating lasting formative uh, meaningful, impactful relationships and friendships with individuals. It's almost as though you're saying my life of public service has been a list of people who've been in my life. Mm-hmm. And through the course of being with them, we've made our country better. But I almost feel as though you really identify with those relationships. Can you speak a little oh, bit? Oh, you just, you don't, we've never met before, just for the record for your audience, right? right. We've never met before this podcast and you just literally hit on the one topic that is the most important to me in life, and that is relationships. Um, I really believe, and out of those relationships, I, I break it down to love, mm-hmm. laughter, mm-hmm. and connectivity, mm-hmm. right? So yes, yes, and yes to relationships. It is all about relationships. Now, I when I was younger, and so many millennials that might be listening... You know, we think you go to work, you work a room, right? You network. Mm-hmm. And I hate the word network. I say I don't use the word networking because I think it's, it's... It implies you're using people absolutely. for their titles to get ahead That's exactly without right. valuing their humanity. That's right. And they all... And you know, it's just shake your hand and exchange business cards. Well, you know what? That is the golf. That's That was golf in the 80s. It's you know, you go golfing together and they thought that was going to get you the new gig, right? Yeah. No, I say it's about meaningful connection. So, in other words, when you go meet somebody and you're at a at a, at a conference, right, and you're trying to meet new people to uh, to pr- to pursue your career or to enhance your career or to enhance a business product or sell a product or a service, um, I really believe that when you meaningfully connect in a meaningful way, let's say. Um, that's real and genuine yeah. because you really want to know that person's story, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Not simply because I want to sell you a product or a service. People know when you're being genuine and real. So yes, it's about relationships. Relationships are the key to not only our personal life, but our business life, our political life. And if, if people don't like you and they don't trust you, they're not going to love you, they're not going to respect you, and they're not going to buy your product or your service. It is that simple for me. Now, the second piece is laughter. If I start with self-deprecating laughter, if you can laugh at yourself. There's a Jewish sense of humor that you Yeah, have. absolutely. <laughs> if you can laugh at yourself, then you're sharing with the people around you your vulnerability. Because you just told them we're equal. Because mm-hmm. you can go to the bank on it. The one thing we all have in common is... We all have vulnerabilities and insecurities. Most people mask them and hide them. I own them. 
Mm-hmm. I acknowledge them and I'm transparent about them. Why? Because it has brought me 55 years of amazing relationships, meaningful, valuable, loving relationships that have brought me an empowerment that I could not have gotten anywhere else or any other way. And so I say, make yourself vulnerable, be real, live your truth, love without limitation, and laugh as often and as damn loud as possible every single chance you get. So that has been Mo Vela, who speaks primarily of public service in terms of acknowledging the humanity that we all have in common But not only is he driven to serve our common collective humanity, but whenever he enters a room, he seeks to engage an individual and recognize and value the humanity inherent in every single individual. And by doing that, not only does he gain empathy for those who he would serve in political public capacities, but he also develops lasting friendships. And those are the very elements that provide the most meaning to the life of Mo Vela. So this has been episode 62 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. Mo, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jordan, for having me. It was wonderful. Thank you. And we will talk to you next time. Bye.